بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا هم بعد. So this is going to be إن شاء الله تعالى our last حلقة for this year of 2018. Uh, and I thought that إن شاء الله تعالى I'll continue what I had done two weeks ago or three weeks ago when we did the reality of bid'ah. And I went over a number of uh, important categories, a number of issues. So please, for those of you that haven't listened to part one, this is actually part two. For those of you that haven't listened to that, uh, please go back and listen to the reality of bid'ah. This is actually a continuation from where we uh, left off. And we're going to be utilizing some of the material from uh, that lecture as well. I'm not going to be covering over it again. Uh, so today's topic is about essentially celebrations, but in order to understand celebrations, we have to link it to another topic, and that is the topic of imitating the kuffar, tashabbu uh, bil kuffar. And that is because one of the main reasons why some of our scholars prohibit certain types of celebrations is because they link it to the issue of imitating the kuffar, and they say that because it is haram to imitate the kuffar, therefore celebrations become haram. So today's topic, even though it's about celebrations, Celebrations and the fiqh of celebrations, because it is so deeply entrenched with the issue of tashabbuh, we also have to briefly talk about that. Obviously, I always make this disclaimer every single time, and I do so because a lot of times, even if you see my comments on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, a lot of people, they say, oh, you missed this point, you missed that point. I have one lecture. And this topic can easily be many, many lectures. I can't do everything. So I always make this disclaimer. Still doesn't matter. People say, I haven't covered this or that. Khair, inshallah. Anyway, so let us begin. Uh, today's topic is a very, very sensitive one that some people, some people get very emotionally charged up about. They have made up their minds. They're firmly entrenched in their p opinions. And in reality, they have, whether they understand it or not, linked their identity, really, with this issue of making something haram. Such that when somebody comes along and says, oh, maybe it's not haram, they literally feel as if their identity has now been completely destroyed, as if they are no longer religious or practicing Muslims. And that is why it is difficult to have a dialogue, even I myself, for many, many, many years, I haven't given, this is the first time I'm actually giving a lecture about this, because I know the backlash that is caused in the minds of some uh, practicing Muslims. I merely ask you to set aside your preconceived notions or prejudices and listen with an open mind, to listen with an iman-filled mind, I'm going to quote you evidences from the Quran and Sunnah. This isn't coming out of far left field. I'll quote you our own ulama, and I will explain to you that, in fact, a very easy argument can be made to defend both positions. Again, it's not as if it's a clear-cut qat'i issue. There are two opinions, as there are usually the case. And the fact of the matter is that, in this case, one of the opinions clearly seems to be more rooted uh, in uh, academic knowledge than the other. But inshallah, let us uh, begin with our preliminaries. So, what is Eid? What is a celebration? The word Eid is a noun that comes from the verb Ada Ya'udu. And Eid signifies two things a regular return at a time interval and a congregation of people. So, Eid is called Eid, our religious Eid is called Eid because it happens every year at the same time and because people gather together at that time. So Eid means to repeat, to come again and again, Ada Ya'udu, and also Ijtima'un Nas, people come together. So the reason why our holy festivals are called Eid is because number one, they occur regularly, every day, the first of every year, uh, the first of Shawwal is going to be our Eid al-Fitr, and the 10th uh, of Dhul Qa'ida is going to be our Eid al-Adha, a set in stone, every year. And then also what happens on Eid, Ijtima'un Nas, people come together, it's a celebration, it is something that people do. This is why an Eid is called Eid, and we see the, and this is the technical term, and we see the linguistic meaning of this, in the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which says in Arabic, it's in Sunan Abi Dawood, لا تجعلوا قبري عيدا. لا تجعلوا قبري عيدا. Don't make my qabr an Eid. Don't make my qabr an Eid. Now, this hadith, people easily misunderstand it. The Prophet is saying, don't make my qabr Eid. And a Muslim reads this hadith and says, how could anybody be happy and festive at the qabr of the Prophet ﷺ. When the hadith says, don't make my qabr an Eid, and when you say Eid in the Muslim mind, you think happiness, celebration, sweets, mitai, halwa. It's like, how can the qabr become an Eid? 
But the linguistic meaning of Eid is not festival per se. Linguistic meaning of Eid is what? To come repetitively, right? To make it a frequent point, to come there. So the Prophet is saying, don't make my qabr a regular place of visitation, i.e. Eid. Don't ada ya'udu, don't keep on coming back to my qabr and make it the goal. Rather than the masjid or the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So using the word Eid over here. And of course, we know we have two Eids in Islam. Uh, the two primary Eids that we have, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha. And this is something mujma' alayhi, alhamdulillah, there's no ikhtilaf uh, amongst all the scholars. Our Prophet ﷺ entered Medina the first year of the Hijrah as we know. And he saw the people celebrating two days. And he said... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has substituted your two days for two better days, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Okay, this is an important hadith, memorize it. He has substituted your two days with two better days, Eid al-Fitr and, and Eid al-Adha. So this hadith clearly indicates that we have two primary Eids and it is something that is well known. Also, we have the word Eid in another hadith. We'll come back to this hadith as well. I'm going to quote it now. And this is the hadith reported in also Abu Dawood and Muslim Imam Ahmed, where a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, I made a promise, a vow, another to Allah to sacrifice a camel at a place called Buwana. Buwana is a small coastal village close to Yathrib on the, on the uh, Red Sea. So I made another to Allah to sacrifice a camel at Buwana. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Was this place, Buwana, a place where there was an idol or an Eid of the Eids of Jahiliyyah? And the man said, No. So the Prophet said, In that case, fulfill your vow. Go and sacrifice the camel at Buwana. Okay? So he asked, Was that land an Eid? And what does Eid over here mean? People coming there, celebrating a religious festival. And the concept, therefore, of a place and a time being Eid is something well known and understood. And there are the hadith we already mentioned of the Prophet ﷺ saying Allah has given you two better Eids. So he's abrogating other Eids. And we have the statement of the Sahabi. This isn't a hadith. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As said, Whoever lives in the land of idolatry and builds his house in the land of idolatry and celebrates their Nairuz. Nairuz is a pagan festival. It is still common in lands that used to be Zoroastrian. It used to be a Zoroastrian festival. The uh, Majus, they, they, they had no ruz. Uh, no ruz, the Desi speak was Neiroz, new day, new year. Right? No ruz is Neiroz, the new year, new day. So no ruz was the festival of Zoroastrians. And with the coming of Islam, the Zoroastrians basically left their Zoroastrianism, they embraced Islam. But by and large, the festival remained, and it still remains to this day in that region. And it is a festival of just a holiday, a new year now, right? So, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al said, whoever lives with the mushrikeen, builds his house with the mushrikeen, celebrates their Nowruz and their festivals, he shall be resurrected with them. So we have over here the athar or the statement of the Sahabi that the Muslim should not celebrate no ruz. Okay, but do keep in mind, we're going to come back to this point. When is he speaking? He's speaking when no ruz is a religious festival. This is in the time where the Zoroastrians are everywhere and no ruz has a clear religious element to it. It is the festival of Zoroastrianism. So the issue therefore comes that what is the Islamic verdict on celebrating festivals other than the two festivals of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. So two primary reasons are given by those scholars who say that we should not celebrate festivals. Uh, as you can already tell, there are two opinions on this issue, as always the case, and uh, we're going to mention both of them. Those scholars that say one should not celebrate any festival other than Fitr and Adha, they have a number of excuses, primarily two. Number one, they say any festival other than the two Eids will constitute a bid'ah in Islam. Okay, so they say any festival is an innovation into the religion. And last halaqa that I gave on bid'ah, we went over the types of bid'ah, the categories of bid'ah, and we explained what is a bid'ah. And we say, and I say very clearly, any festival that is done without the intention of getting Allah's reward cannot be called a bid'ah. 
A bid'ah has to be in the matter of the religion. Okay, so some scholars were a little bit uh, encompassing. They stretched the definition of bid'ah and they basically argued that a festival is always associated with holiness and religiosity. And so introducing any festival inherently is going to be linked to bid'ah. And this is a stretch that belies experience. It goes against the common experience of the world that we live in. That there are religious festivals, everybody knows them, and then there are secular festivals that people do that are not of any particular faith. So that is a bit of a stretch, and we already talked about bid'ah, I'm not going to go down that basically today, it's already been there. Uh, essentially, any non-religious festival cannot be argued as being bid'ah, it is nonsensical. Bid'ah can only be done when you do a festival and you think it is Islamic. And even then we talked about the categories and we went over bid'ah idafi and all of that. I mentioned that's last class in any case. The next thing that they say, all celebrations are haram because it is imitating the kuffar. This is the second reason they say, tashabbu bil kuffar, imitating the kuffar. This is where we need to now pause the issue of celebration, spend around 25, 30 minutes talking about this issue of imitating the kuffar. And inshallah, this is basically half of today's lecture. So it's going to be two birds with one stone. Celebrations imitating the kuffar because they are linked together. And inshallah as well, the concept of imitating the kuffar will benefit us. What does it mean? What is haram and what not? So now we begin, is it true that our religion tells us to not imitate the kuffar? Response, there are verses and a hadith that do seem to suggest some type of principle. It's not coming out of thin air. For example, the Quran says, Surah Baqarah verse 120, The Yahud and the Nasara will not be fully content with you. Rida is the highest level of contentment. They're not going to be fully content with you until you follow their milla. Okay? Now, what does milla mean? So, some would say their milla means anything to do with them. So, they make the argument that anything that does that is related to their ways, their lifestyle, their custom is their milla. So, therefore, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, the Yahud and the Nasara will not have rida with you until you follow their milla, which means you shouldn't be following their milla. Is that clear? It's very, they make a generic argument from this uh, verse. And the most explicit hadith, there's nothing explicit in the Quran that says don't make the shabu with kuffar, it's generic stuff like this. But the hadith, there is a very explicit hadith, and it is authentic. It's in Abu Dawud. It's not in Bukhari Muslim, but it's in Abu Dawud. Uh, and that hadith is. مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ This is the simple hadith that everybody should memorize. It is the, the fundamental hadith that talks about imitation. مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever تَشَبَّه And تَشَبَّه means to imitate, to be similar to. Whoever imitates a group of people shall be counted as amongst them. مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever imitates a group of people shall be counted amongst them. And this is the most explicit hadith that seems to indicate if you're tashabbaha with uh, Zoroastrians, then you will be counted amongst the Zoroastrians. If you tashabbaha with Buddhists, you will be counted amongst the Buddhists. So this hadith makes a generic argument. Whoever tashabbaha, whoever imitates a people, shall be counted amongst them. We also have two dozen a hadith, a lot of a hadith. That's quite a lot that specifically prohibit or allow things based on not imitating the others. Okay, can anybody think of any hadith that comes to mind? There's a, there's a lot. What about it? Excellent example, simple example. The issue of Muharram, fasting one day. When he was told the Yahud fast that one day, what did he say? Oh, I'm going to fast two days then. Shows you what? Doing something different. Okay? Uh, the Prophet, for example, said that 
be different from the Ahli Kitab. Let your beards grow and trim your mustache. Because they would let their beards grow and grow their mustache. He said, be different from them. Let your beards grow and trim your mustache. The Prophet ﷺ said, be different from the Yahud. They don't pray in their shoes, so you pray in their, your shoes. The Yahud back then would take their shoes off. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ instructed Muslims to pray with their shoes. Ironically, the situation has changed 180 now. And the Yahud wear their shoes when they pray by and large. And we are all barefooted over here. Okay, but that we're going to get back to this point. So when the Prophet ﷺ said this hadith, the Yahud would be barefoot when they prayed. But the point is, he said, be different from the Yahud. Pray in your shoes. Okay? And the Sahaba for their entire lives would pray in their shoes. The masjid, they would walk into the shoes. As you know, they would pray with their shoes on back then. And there are so many other things. The Prophet said, be different from the Ahli Kitab. Put henna, uh, yani, do isbaag of your beard. Isbaag is to put henna in your beard. Yani, dye your beard. When your beard goes white, it is sunnah to dye the beard. We should not keep it fully white as was the custom of the, uh, sorry, not he said, Khaliful Mushrikeen. Sorry. Be different from the Mushrikeen. Because the Mushrikeen would like to have full white beard when you become older. And the Prophet said, that's not the sunnah. The sunnah is to have the isbaagh or the henna dyed in. And the hadith of Abu Bakr's father as well uh, is mentioned over here. He said, don't imitate the kuffar, dye his beard, dye the beard. So we have many other instances, as I said, around 20 ahadith. Where the Prophet says, be different from, do this. Be different from, don't do that. So we have a whole bunch of a hadith that clearly say that we should not be following the ways of other peoples. And also, we have the hadith in Tirmidhi where the Prophet criticized later Muslims. And he said, you are going to follow the ways of those before you. Footstep by footstep and inch by inch, so much so that if they enter the lizard hole, you too will enter the lizard hole. Now there are so many of these hadith. We should also mention one other hadith before we move on. And that is that all of these hadith came in late Madani time frame, not in Mecca and not in early Medina. And uh, there is a clear reason for this. And um, uh, Ibn Abbas narrates, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Abbas narrates, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved to agree with the Ahli Kitab in all those matters that he was not prohibited from doing so. And so when he migrated to Medina, he parted his hair in the middle like the Ahli Kitab did. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. The Ahli Kitab, the Yahud, had their hair in a certain way, he followed them. Then, at some time in the Madani stage, he began to make mukhalafa. Okay? So this hadith shows us that at one phase of the seerah, in fact the entire Meccan phase and some of the early Madani phase, there was no mukhalafa. There was no command to make no tashabbu. This came later on. And this is a key point because our Prophet would never have done something that is intrinsically evil. He never drank alcohol. He never worshipped idols. Things that are intrinsically evil, he could never have done. The fact that at some stage, he was wanting to copy Ahli Kitab, shows that intrinsically, it's not at all times, at all places evil. Rather, at certain points, something happened. And what was it that happened? Well, I'll just mention it now, and this is what very few scholars point this out. The majority of scholars, they just go with the flow and they just say, oh, mukhalaf, mukhalaf. But the fact of the matter is, and some scholars did point out, this switch occurred. And that switch indicates there was a reason. And what is the reason? The reason is the political landscape changed. Islam became dominant and powerful. It became its own civilization. When Islam became its own civilization, then we should set the standard and not follow other standards. When Islam was being persecuted, when Islam was the, the one that's not you know, at the top at this stage, right? At that stage, it did not make sense to make mukhalafa. It would have been problematic to, uh, to oppose. And the Prophet ﷺ did not oppose at that time. So the concept of, of uh, and, uh, and one can also say, by the way, one can, one can also say that at that stage, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to copy the Ahli Kitab because the Ahli Kitab were closer to the truth than the pagans. So by copying the Ahli Kitab, he is still closer to the truth 
than paganism. Now that Islam has become dominant, he doesn't need to show that anymore at all, and he can now set the standard and move on from that. So the issue of mukhalafatul kuffar, of being different from the kuffar, is one that is, yes, it is something that does exist in our tradition, and that many, many scholars have written books about it. And perhaps the most famous book ever written, and definitely one of the most thorough books ever written, is the book by Shaykh Rasam ibn Taymiyyah, which is called Iqtida Sirat al Mustaqim li Mukhalafati Ashab al Jahim. Following the Sirat al Mustaqim by going against the people of Jahim. The title of the book tells you. Following the Sirat al Mustaqim by making Mukhalafa, by being different of the people going to Jahim. Whoever is going to Jahim, we don't want to be like them. We should be other than them, and that's how we're going to be on. Sirat al-Mustaqim. Okay, and he establishes in this book, a two-volume book, it's a nice chunky volume, it's two-volume book. He is a very detailed book. Uh, a PhD has been written as well in some university about this. Uh, I came across it. And the book is available in Arabic and a summarized version is somewhere in English, a very summarized version, not the whole book at all. And in this book, he establishes a, a psychological and theoretical foundation to make the argument that tashabbuh is wrong, tashabbuh is detrimental to one's iman and to one's faith. And he basically says, I'm summarizing the, the entire two volumes in three minutes, he basically says that it is healthy for a community to be associated in each and every way possible, outwardly and inwardly. You want to be associated with the people of the truth, with the people of your own faith, of your own religion. It is, he calls it a shi'ar, a sign of Islam, that you demonstrate your Islam and others see your Islam. And he gives examples like, you know, you feel a camaraderie when you see somebody dressed up like you. Automatically, there's a connection, right? If you're in a strange land wearing your clothes, you know, just imagine a Pakistani comes in Shavar Kameez, early America, 60, 70, he doesn't have any other clothes. He sees another Shavar Kameez in the crowd. What's he going to do? automatically there's going to be that connection, right? That connection, Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, is good to have for people of Iman. What's wrong with it? If you're Iman and you have other people of Iman, you should strengthen one another in that regard. And he mentions that this is why our dress indicates our internal attitude. Why do we dress up when we go to an event, when we go to an interview? We're not going to go in our pajamas. It indicates something. Why is there a gear or a... Um, uh, 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 a code of dress for specific things. So the army, the military, why do they dress in a certain manner? When they dress up in those army fatigues, they actually get in the spirit of doing and marching and whatnot. It has an impact, okay? I go scuba all the time. When I dress up in my scuba gear, even if I'm not in the water, I'm just waiting to get into the water. It's just there. It's human nature that you want to do that. So his point is, of course, that Muslims should have that collective feeling and let people of other faith Look, dress in their manner, let them be different and dress in their manner, and let people of Islam dress in their manner as well. And of course, he quotes the famous uh, uh, decree of Umar bin Khattab, uh, which is the, the famous decree which has been obviously criticized roundly by many people because it, it, it uh, goes against modern, you know, uh, the, the modern nation state and secularism. It definitely does go against it from that regard. Uh, and that is that uh, Umar radiallahu anhu made a decree that people of different faiths should wear different clothing. This was in his khilafah. Muslims should dress like this, and it is not allowed for them to wear the clothing of the Ahli Kitab. The Ahli Kitab dress like this, that's their clothing, that's their clothing. They shouldn't dress the way Muslims dress. So he made a ruling in this regard, and it is called the ruling of Umar. And he had a, a, a long list of issues. And, and by the way, the ruling of Umar uh, was not universally applied throughout Islam. Okay, It is very clear anybody who says to the contrary is simply wrong. The bulk of Islamic history was not applied. Whether you you agree with that being valid or not is a separate issue. I'm just saying as a factual statement for the majority of the ummah's existence, civilizations did not enforce these types of codes of conduct, even though, yes, socially it was understood, but there was no enforcement on this. This was something that very rarely uh, took place. But Ibn Taymiyyah quotes this as well. And he then spends one volume out of two talking about celebrations. Basically, 40% of the book is about celebrations. Even though it's about tashabbuh, but where does most of the tashabbuh occur? 
in these celebrations. And he specifically mentions the Nowruz and the various Christian festivals, and he uh, claim, and of course says that it is not allowed to celebrate them at all. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah, by the way, he makes a, a very uh, interesting tidbit. He just mentions it and then moves on, and it shows you that his argument is much more nuanced than many of his later followers make out. He says that these laws are contextual, Ibn Taymiyyah says, and he says that at some times and some places, Tashabbuh with kuffar becomes mubah or maybe even wajib or mustahab. This is Ibn Taymiyyah who has two volumes against the Shabbu. He just has one paragraph and then moves on. But it is that one paragraph that interests us. And he mentions at some times, at some occasions, the Shabbu might be mubah, might even be mustahab, maybe even it is wajib. And he gives only three or four examples and then he moves on because that's not the purpose of his book. And of the examples he gives, for example, if a Muslim is living in Dar al-Kufr or Dar al-Harb, and it is going to cause an issue for him to dress differently. In that case, it becomes mustahab to dress like the people. This is Ibn Taymiyyah, who overall was very strict that Muslims should have their dress code. But see, here is the problem, and I keep on, I've said this many times before, that many of the followers of Ibn Taymiyyah, they actually tarnish the image of Ibn Taymiyyah. And they just copy and paste his fatawa without understanding where he's coming from. Ibn Taymiyyah is writing in Damascus of 700 Hijrah. He is writing when there is a powerful Mamluk civilization. He is writing when there is Izzah and glory. When 90% of the city is going to be Muslim. It's a very different time and place. And for his followers to copy and paste snippets and then apply them in modern secular humanistic democracies in a very different time and place this is simply wrong, and that is one of my main arguments in today's lecture. That some of these fatawa might be valid when they were uttered, by whom they were uttered. But fatwas are contextual, they are not permanent, they are not the speech of Allah. Allah did not forbid certain things. Certain times and places might have done so. So, uh, anyway, the point is that Ibn Taymiyyah does have this book, you should be aware of it. Many other books were written as well, I'm not going to go over a history of these books written. However, realize one point. For most of Islam's history, Muslims lived in Muslim-majority lands that were ruled by Islam. There was a Khilafah, a Sultanate, an empire, whether it was the Mughal Empire, whether it was the Ottoman lands, whether it was the Mamluk. Most of the time, Muslims are living in Muslim-dominant countries, or not even countries, not called countries. The nation-state is a modern construct, as you know, it is a European uh, construct. But the point is that the concept of Muslims living as a thriving minority in a lawn Muslim land was very, very rare, almost unheard of before modernity. As well, the advent of colonization changed the dynamics of Muslim, non-Muslim interaction. So when the colonizers came and they didn't come, they invaded Muslim lands. When the colonizers invaded Muslim lands, the issue of imitating the kuffar once again was brought up. Think about it. You have people of other faiths coming in, pillaging your country, raping literally and metaphorically your peoples and your lands. Okay, Acquiring, destroying, this and that. In that context, for the last 250 years, basically, uh, Napoleon basically invaded Egypt in 1790, uh, 1780s, 1790s, and that's the beginning of colon the, the beginning of official colonization. Before this, you have unofficial colonization, where you know anyway. But let's not go into there. Anyway, where was I? Colonization began unofficially 1600s, officially late 1700s, and. At that point in time, the issue of tashabbuh bil kuffar once again was brought to the forefront. Why? Can anybody tell me why? Imitating the kuffar at this point in time. Quickly, quick, we don't have time. Hurry up. Okay, so there's a sense of identity here against, the, against them. What else? It's a valid point. What else? Recognize who's Muslim, who's not. Okay, what else? You are being invaded. Do you want to copy the invaders? What does it show about your own self-izzah? If the people that have raped and pillaged you 
are the same people you want to emulate. Think about that. Izzah. Dignity. Dignity. It's your dignity at stake here. Have you no shame? Have you no dignity? That the very people that have destroyed your civilization, you will then put them on a pedestal? Okay? This notion of the Izzah of Islam came to the forefront. And that is why in the last 250 years, the issue of Tashabbub al-Kuffar came to the forefront of discussions. In medieval Islam, it's there, here and there. Ibn Taymiyyah wrote one book on it. It is two volumes, but it is not the majority. He, he wrote literally hundreds of volumes. It is not a major source of books and writings in medieval Islam. It's there, but it's, you know, it's not a big deal. But in the last 250 years, and especially in the era of colonization, and now we're talking about this all the time, it changes a lot of things. And of course, the issue comes, as we said, of dignity and izzah. And this is across. So this isn't just an Ibn Taymiyyah or a Salafi issue. This transcends any one trend. So, for example, the famous African scholar, Uthman Dan Fodio, who died in 1817. Uthman Dan Fodio was a great alim uh, from, uh, uh, from Africa, from the Fulani tribe. And he founded the Sokoto Empire. And the Sokoto Empire was a magnificent empire in Africa that was lasting for 200-something years. And he fought his, his empire, not him himself, fought against the British and this, I mean, there's a very amazing legacy of the Sukkot Empire. The founder is Uthman Dan Fodio. And he's writing at a time when the British are invading and they're colonizing and they're, you know, doing their things, whatnot. He writes a treatise called Tahdiru Ahl al-Iman min tashabbuh bi ahl al-Kuffari wal isyan Warning the people of Iman from imitating the Kuffar and the evil people. Another warning book. And he, uh, at this stage, he writes that Muslims should not be dressing in the style of the colonizers, of the people that are basically taking us over. And of course, it makes complete sense. I mean, these are the people that are literally killing you, literally. And you're going to abandon your culture and abandon your people and a sense of inferiority complex and you're going to dress like them. Okay, complete makes completely sense. And of course, Uthman Dan Fodio, as we said, it's not just any one trend of Islam. He's a Maliki scholar of the Ash'ari school of theology, a Qadiri Sufi. And he's writing in a way that very much allies with Ibn Taymiyyah. Very much. It's really the same spirit. And it's not just Maliki, Qadiri, Ash'ari. In India, when the British came, again, there was a very strong movement to oppose the British in everything that the British had to do. This was something that was very well known. And in particular, the Deoband school, and of course our Indian brothers all know the Deoband school, and we should all understand that the Deobandi school is a direct reaction to the British invasion. The Deoband Madrasa was founded after the mutiny of 1857. Literally, it is literally caused by the collapse of the Mughal Empire. So the Deobandi tradition overall, and I say this with respect, I'm not Deobandi, so it's awkward whenever I talk about another tradition, but I'm equally critical of all and respectful of all now, inshallah, no big deal. Point is that one needs to understand what is the mindset of the Deobandi tradition. The Deoband is being established literally after the British have kicked out and exiled exiled the last Mughal em emperor. And the beautiful dynasty of Islamic India has collapsed. And the British have now taken over completely. What do you think is going to be the mindset of the ulama? It's going to be a very closed, very angry with the British. Legit how would, of course they're going to be angry with the British. Of course there's going to be this somewhat of a, a, a self izza mentality, like I'm not going to do anything with the British. And so many fatwas were given uh, at the time that it is haram, impermissible to dress like the British, act like the British, eat like the British, learn the British language, go to British schools. And why should they not give such a fatwa? You understand that this is now a sense of we are Muslims. They have come and taken us over. And so fatwas were given. And at the time even, it was considered haram by this group of ulama to study in the British schools. And of course, the British schools at the time were missionary schools. So think of that as well. There was an element of conversion wanting to take place as well. So completely understandable. Okay, My criticism is not of 1857 Deoban. It's that 1918 Deoban hasn't changed much. That's the criticism. It's not that it happened and what it happened, but the mindset is still the uh, same. And 
booklets were written. I came across one, Molvi Abdul Hay as Surati. He wrote a booklet warning the Muslims of India from shaving their beards and from wearing coats and pants and from wearing Angrezon ki topi, the hat of the Angrez. Okay, this is, he get, this is something he said is haram to wear the hat of the British. You should wear the Muslim topi and not Angrezon ki topi. Okay, not the hat of the British. And again, I mean, this was written 100, what, 150 years ago, more than that. Of course, put yourself in the shoes of Indian Muslims. Why would you give up your land, your civilization, your culture, and want to emulate a group of people that have destroyed the Mughal Emperor, Empire? Think about that. Makes 110% sense. And, th and this guy, of course, is a Hanafi Deobandi, what not. He's not some, you know, and the reason I say that because some people say, oh, this is just a Salafi thing, the imitation of the Kufar. No, it's universal in Islam. And another last example, when Atatur came along, uh, this enemy of Islam, he came along, he abolished the caliphate, and he forbade Muslims from wearing their Islamic headgear. And he mandated in the 1923 or 4, he mandated all men must wear English caps, English hats. Because, you know, in that day, Westerners all wore their, their hats. This is well known. I mean, you look up any, any black and white movie, any Westerner, Western movie, why are they wearing hats? It was the custom of the day to wear that cap. So Ataturk, you should know this, Ataturk legislated that every Turkish male must wear European hat. What do you think the ulama are going to say? Tell me. Haram. It's haram. We are Turks. We have our... Who are you to come and tell us to wear? And so a certain Haji Atif Khoja, he wrote a pamphlet in which he claimed that wearing such a hat is a sign of the one who is morally bankrupt. No iman, no taqwa. So the hat becomes the sign of moral bankruptcy. And you know what? I agree with that for the time and place. Very legitimate fatwa, complete, makes sense. Okay, And by the way, he himself in Haji, Haji uh, Atif Khoja, he writes in his pamphlet that he, he is one of the few that mentions that the Prophet Sallallahu he was the one who initially, he wanted to copy the Ahadi Kitab. Then when the power balance shifted in the favor of Islam, then he wanted to be different from the Ahadi Kitab. What he's implying is that the uh, Atatürk is doing the opposite. That the power balance is the opposite now. Now you have an inferiority complex and you want to do the um, other way. And so we have these types of treatises written in Egypt, in Damascus, in India, in Istanbul, and it makes complete sense. But the issue we need to ask ourselves is, is it Islamic to copy and paste those fatwas from those times and places and then put them and bring them into our time and place? Once upon a time, dressing like a European was something that only Europeans did. No Muslim dressed like that. And there were no Muslims in Europe in large quantities. And it was a Muslim land. So for Muslims in Muslim lands to give up their culture, their habits, their language, and take on the language of the colonizer, wallahi, there is no doubt this is inferiority complex. And we worry about inferiority complex of Iman and not just inferiority complex of civilization. Okay, this is very clear. But that was over a century ago, more than a century ago. And since that time and place, obviously, much has changed. Much has changed. And based on that, therefore, our scholars themselves have also begun to change. Realize that it wasn't just coats and hats. Fatwas were given at the time, believe it or not, that wearing watches was haram too. Because it was not something that Muslims did. Okay? Fatwas are given of many different natures in this regard. But as we said, one needs to understand at that time and place, to do something different from your people indicated something. Ibn Taymiyyah himself writes, and now I quote that paragraph. If a Muslim is in Darul Harb or in a land of non-Muslims, then in that case, he is not required to appear differently from the people. And then he mentions reasons and 
whatnot. And this is something that again was understood. Uh, the famous Egyptian scholar Muhammad Abdu as well. He was asked more than a hundred years ago, uh, Muslims in South Africa, because South African Muslims, are I spoke about them a few months ago as well. Muslims from South Africa, they were wearing the European style uh, hat. And uh, the, he was asked this fatwa, is it halal to wear the European style hat uh, in South Africa? And he gave the fatwa that it is permissible for them to do that because it shields them from the sun, because the situation is different, etc., etc. Now, we see, therefore, that we do have these rules of not imitating the kuffar. But looking at the text and the context, we can derive four principles, okay? And these are the four principles that I will use before I move on to the final point, which is the issue of celebrations. Firstly, the primary prohibition of imitating the kuffar deals with rites of worship and religious festivals. Therefore, anything that is religious of another religion, the default is that it is haram. Any ritual, any worship that they do, any festival that they do, if a person does the religious ritual that is unique to that ritual, there is no doubt they have fallen into haram. And if they do it thinking Allah will reward them, then it is haram and bid'ah. If they do it from a religion's perspective, it is haram and bid'ah. And if you now go back to those 20 ahadith I mentioned, almost all of them deal with specific rituals. Some of them are customs, but almost all of them deal with rituals. So, the first rule, the default is that Imitating the religious rituals of other faiths is haram, and this is what those ahadith primarily refer to. Secondly, tashabbuh, imitation, can only occur to that which is unique and specific to a particular faith or civilization. Not when it is generic to large groups of mankind. Tashabbuh has to be done for something, whether it is an action or it is a, a libas or it is a festival that is unique to one group of people. If it is done by large segments of different uh, civilizations, there is no tashabbuh because it is generic. And many examples are here. Any type of cuisine, any type of technology, any type of mechanism that people live by, that they adopt from other civilizations and cultures, there is no tashabbuh when it is not unique to one civilization. If large segments of the world are doing something such that it is not recognizable to be one civilization's, then there is no tashabbuh. Man tashabbaha biqawmin fahuwa minhum. There has to be a qawm. That you're making tashabbu of. And there are many examples of this. You know, the uh, Salman radiallahu anh suggestion to build a ditch. Where did it come from? The Persians. Did the Prophet say, oh, I'm not going to do that? No. The issue came of uh, the process of wearing a ring with a st stamp on it. The first time he wrote a letter to Heraclius, they said to him, the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, it is the custom of those people that they will never accept a, a, a letter from a ruler except that there's a wax seal on it so the Prophet didn't say oh tashabbu bil kuffar I can't do it he said okay make this ring for me Muhammad Rasulullah as we know so I said, he made that ring he put the wax seal he sent it to Heraclius there is no tashabbu this is the culture of the world that's what everybody does so he did it okay and uh, so many other things as well I mean cuisine wise our Prophet never ate rice in his whole life he never ate rice. Is somebody going to say, it's tashabbuh to eat rice? No. <coughs> Eating rice is not of one civilization. It's generic food. There's nothing tashabbuh in this as well. So we said that the issue of tashabbuh, it must be something that is unique to a specific faith, a specific civilization. Also, it is very important to note, and Ibn Qayyim himself mentions this, that the whole issue of looking different needs to be taken into the context that our Prophet himself did not look radically different from his own people. This is something that a lot of those who talk about tashabbu bil kuffar, they ignore. When the Prophet said, don't make tashabbu bil kuffar, what was he wearing? The same clothes as the Quraysh of Mecca. The exact same clothes. 
He did not bring about a fashion revolution. Think about this is something that the, 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 the more stricter strand, for example, that they always want to say, don't, don't, don't. They don't understand the context even of the original hadith. The Arabs dressed in a certain manner. Our process was Arab. Here's the point. Man tashabbaha biqawmin fahuwa minhum is not necessarily evil all the time. Whoever imitates a group is of them. The Prophet imitated the Arab. Is he an Arab? Yes or no? Whoever imitates the Arabs is of them. He's an Arab. Is that a problem? No. See, this is the point. That some group of scholars, again, this is Husna, I mean, they, they try their best, but you have to be a little bit more broad in, in your understanding of what's coming going on here. Ibn al-Qayyim himself, this isn't some left-wing progressive talk. Ibn al-Qayyim himself mentions in his book, um, uh, this is not in Ahkam al it will come to me now, I think it's in Amr He mentions that the asl, when it comes to the clothing, the base default and the sunnah is that the person wears the clothes of his people as long as it is halal to do so. Obviously, if you're in a land that doesn't have clothes, it's not sunnah to go naked. So as long as it is halal to do so, our Prophet ﷺ dressed in the clothing of his people. And he dressed up in accordance with the clothing of his people. Hadith that when the Prophet ﷺ visited, when dignitaries visited, he had a special Yemeni cloak he would wear for them. This is dressing up. Now, who told our Prophet ﷺ that a Yemeni cloak is considered dressing up? Did he invent that or was that the custom of the time? You see? It was the custom of the time. Yemen was a better civilization than Hijaz at that time. And Yemen had better cloth and better, you know, embroidery. So the Yemeni cloth, the Yemeni shawl on top was a better garment. So when delegations would come, he would wear Yemeni, the Yemeni shawl on top. He is dressing up in accordance with the culture of his time. So once again, the problem comes, these ulama who talk about tashabbu bil kuffar, there's nothing wrong with tashabbu with your own people when the peoples are generic, like the Prophet himself. If we want to dress up, we will wear a jacket, a coat, a suit. This is our culture. And that is why I say it is sunnah meaning sunnah in the sense of what a Prophet would do. It is sunnah to dress in accordance with the culture of your peoples. And it is a problem that some of our ulama make it something embedded in the minds of the people that anybody who dresses like this cannot be a person of knowledge. He must be dressed. And here's the irony. If you want to look at where a person is coming from, look at the clothing of their ulama. So people of certain persuasion will dress in the kurta, shalwar, white with the turban, you know, and they go back to 1700 India. And that's the sunnah for them. Others are going to be dressing in a uh, Moroccan, you know, thobe with the type of turban, and that's basically 1800 Morocco. Others are going to dress like the Saudi styles of the 1700s, they think that is the sunnah. And each one of their sunnahs is essentially their founders of their own tradition. And they think this is the default. And they don't see the Prophet himself never wore the clothes that they think is the sunnah. Never. Not even the thobe that they wear. Because that fine cotton that they're wearing, with the nice buttons made in Italy, huh? with the beautiful silwar that they wear, and the underwear, let's not forget that as well. right? Because again, let's be honest here. See, and again, I have to some to be a little bit facetious, a little bit sarcastic, because it is irritating that the very people who tell us don't, don't they fall into it without even understanding. Okay? Look at the watches that they're wearing. Okay? Look at the pens that they have. Look at where is it coming from? The small things, you know, the, the jacket, even on the thobe, there's going to be a jacket. Where did that come from? So, in their own way, they are taking even as they tell us, living in western lands, to follow them in their clothes, thinking it is the sunnah. No, it is not the sunnah. And if you understand this point, then as we said, the shabbu can only take place, rule number two, in something that is unique and specific to a particular faith or a particular civilization. Pants and shirts are now no longer a part of one civilization. In 1750 Mughal India, yes it was. Why would an Indian in 1700 Delhi dress like the Angres? Why? No reason. But times have changed. 
and that fatwa is no longer applicable. There is no inferiority complex anymore. We dress up because this is the way we dress up. There's no notion of that's us and them anymore. The Angrez have not only left India, we are in their lands now. Okay? This whole Angrez is the British. The Angrez are no longer in India. Well, indirectly at least, but uh, they're not directly in India. We are now in their lands. Whole situation has changed. So this is the second rule. The third rule here is that there is no tashabbuh without an intention for tashabbuh. You cannot have tashabbuh without wanting to have tashabbuh. In other words, something that's just happening, something that you just do, can never be tashabbuh. How? Two points, or actually even say three points. Number one, the word tashabbuh means there is an extra effort because a little bit advanced Arabic here, but just bear with me. Tashabbuh ala wazni tafa'ul. Tafa'ul means you did something to get there. Tashabbuh means to be similar intentionally or unintentionally. Tashabbuh, you want it to be similar. The word used is tashabbuh, not tashabbuh. And tashabbuh means to be similar. Our Prophet did not forbid tashabbuh. He forbade tashabbuh. Tashabbuh means you go out of your way and you intend, I want to copy that person. Anything that you do just because you're doing it, because everybody's doing it, that's not tashabbuh. Also we say, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Actions are by intentions. And so, if there is no intention for tashabbu, then it is not tashabbu. And of course, there's something, some of the classical scholars as well said, Ibn Abidin, a famous Hanafi alim, um, he mentions in his book that tashabbu is only makru when the issue itself is blameworthy and when the intention is to imitate. When the intention is to imitate. When the intention is not to imitate and the issue is generic, what clothes you wear, what food you're going to eat, there's no tashabbu in this regard. Therefore, that which occurs naturally amongst any groups of people, this might be tashabuh, but it is not tashabuh. And tashabuh is not haram. Tashabuh is haram. Fourthly, that which is no longer unique to non-Muslims is no longer haram to imitate. Something that might have been unique in the past but is no longer unique now, it is no longer haram to imitate. And this is something, again, this isn't something I'm inventing. Classical ulama mentioned many examples in medieval times. The problem comes, and I say this with utmost respect, many of our ulama still, their mindset is in medieval times. They cut and paste those fatawa, and they stick to them without allowing their own intellects to think about the context of those fatawa and broaden. Not all of them, but some or many of them are like this. And this is unfortunately, in my humble opinion, you've listened to my lectures enough to know, this is one of the reasons why, unfortunately, there is a disconnect between many of the scholars and between the populations of Muslims. A lot of times the scholars, with my utmost respect to them, they are operating in their own little circles of influence amongst their very practicing, very hardcore conservative Muslims and the rest of the ummah is disconnected from them. And there are reasons for this. One of them being again, anyway, so this is my, my criticism here. When the situation changes and it is no longer unique to the kuffar, then it is no longer prohibited to imitate. And this is why you see me dressed up in this manner over here. Whereas I myself, 200 years ago, would have fully agreed with the fatwas that it is haram to dress up like this. Because dressing up like this 200 years ago would imply something very different. In India, in Ottoman Turkey, in Damascus. Whereas now, times and places have changed. And again, this isn't anything new. For example, there are many athar of the, the Sahaba. Some even say there's a da'if hadith, but there are athar of the Sahaba. There are definitely you know, statements where wearing a certain type of cap, which is called a tayalisa, was considered to be something not good to do. However, this tayalisa cap was worn by the Jews of a certain place. However, and it resembles the type of, frankly, frankly, the shimag that some of the Saudis wear these days, something similar to that. Okay, and many other cultures wear. Okay, it resembles like that. Um, but uh, the tayalisa was considered to be forbidden or makruh by many of the classical ulama, the first two, three generations, because it was something the Yahud did. Slowly but surely, the Muslims kept on wearing, 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 until it became something they themselves did. Ibn Hajar, 
comments on this prohibition and he says this would only have been forbidden when the tayalisa was something that was only worn by the Jews but that is no longer the case now so it is permissible to wear it this is Ibn Hajar writing not some left field progressive guy and in fact one of the famous scholars of hadith was called Imam At-Tayalisi because he was known from a family of this. He was called Imam At-Tayalisi. And the same goes for many other issues. Uh, Imam Ahmed, for example, and some of the early scholars, many of the early scholars, even some Sahaba, they insisted that Muslims wear their turbans with tahnik. And tahnik means you take it over here and you take it under your beard and you throw it behind. Okay, so this is the tahnik. It goes underneath it. And they said that it is makru, it shouldn't be done, that you don't practice tahnik. This is the first generation. This was the hijazi style of wearing the turban, let's say. Well, as Islam spread, people wore turbans in different manners. And people would, you know, cut off the tail and wear only the turban. And that version in the time of the first generations was not done by the Arabs. It was done by the Ajam or other people. And there are athar from the early Sahaba and Tabi'un to not dress with the turban. There's not no hadith. There's no hadith like this. It's just Sahaba, the and Tabi'un and Imams to have tahnik. Later scholars said, no big deal. If you do tahnik, no tahnik, no big deal. What happened? People just kept on wearing, wearing, wearing until finally it became something that is um, permitted. So therefore, it is very, very clear that our scholars understood that something might be tashabbu in one time or one place or one land, but it is not tashabbu in another time or another place or another land. And that is, I think, where, unfortunately, a lot of times when you hear these haram fatwas, those scholars are not following this simple rule. Certain things might have been tashabbu, they're no longer tashabbu. Now, this is pretty clear. But let's get to the final issue before we get to the actual, uh, the actual, we haven't even done the Eids yet, we're going to do that in a while, inshallah. Don't worry, we'll get it done today, inshallah. Let's get to the final issue. We talked about a culture ceasing to be unique to uh, non-Muslims, like the libas. What if a religious ritual ceases to be a religious ritual? You see the difference between the libas and the ritual? What if something that used to be from the deen of the non-Muslims slowly over time stopped to be from their deen and became something from their culture? This is the key point here. Okay. Does the ruling, is it related to the origin such that no matter what happens, we will go back to the origin? Or is the ruling related to how people perceive it? Such that if it's ritual, it will be ritual. And if it is custom, it will be custom. Remember, rule number one was rituals are haram to imitate. That's rule number one, right? Well, what if it used to be a ritual, but it is now a custom and no longer a ritual? Okay, here is where we have two camps. Here is where we had two schools of thought. A well-known position, and this is the one that basically makes these celebrations haram, is that it doesn't matter how people view it, we go back to the origin. And if the origin is pagan, then the ritual will be pagan, even if it is no longer practiced as paganism. And this is the basis of which many celebrations are considered to be haram. And you will read this in any fatwa that makes it haram. They will go back to its origin. They'll look up some book. A lot of times it's not even true. Sometimes it might be true. It's not. It's irrelevant whether it's true or not. But the point is that the harim is based on its origin. And they say, ah, what is the origin of birthdays? What is the origin of Nowruz? What is the origin of New Year's? What is the origin of this and that? And they will go and link it to something pagan. The famous fatwa you've all heard of, what is the origin of the ties? Even though this is a myth, the origin of the ties is not the cross, but still, the fatwa was given, and so it's still common in our days to hear it. The ties used to be a Christian symbol, and therefore it is haram, because the origin is uh, uh, you know, a Christian symbol. So they will link it to the origin. However, I respectfully disagree with that and I say that it is very clear looking at the Sharia and at lived realities and I'll explain it is very clear 
And in my mind, personally, it is crystal clear. And this is the position of, frankly, frankly, the majority of scholars of the world beyond one strand of Islam. There's one strand that is very hardcore on this, but the majority of scholars of the world beyond that strand, they, they don't view it this way. They say that what is considered to be a custom is a custom regardless of its origin being a ritual. You look at the niyyah, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ You look at the niyyah, and they actually bring the evidence of the hadith of Buwana. Remember this, the slaughter of the camel? They bring that back. There's an interesting point here. In one version, when the man comes and says to the Prophet I want to slaughter a camel in Buwana, in one version, Ibn Majah, the Prophet Wasallam says, do you find something of jahiliya still in your heart in Bawana? And the man says, no. So the Prophet said, in that case, go to Buwana. Notice what he linked it to. Do you find some of the feelings of jahiliya? Do you still have that veneration? Is that something? Why Babuana? What is there? Is that something you're linking to jahiliya? He said, no. In that case, then go. So, niyya matters. Not that Buwana might have been a pagan land a thousand years ago. The man did not feel any attachment religiously to Buwana. Do you have anything in your heart of jahiliya? No? Okay then, go do it. This hadith is in Ibn Majah. And from this, I would say the majority of scholars beyond that one strand that thinks they're following Ibn Taymiyyah, but I don't think they're following Ibn Taymiyyah, that one strand, they, beyond that one strand, they basically say, we don't look at the origin 15,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. We look at the lived reality. And based on that, therefore, they say, if the people don't view this as being a ritual, and they view it as being a custom, then we will view it as being a custom and not a ritual. And this is, I would say, the lived experiential reality of human beings. Let us look at the issue of birthdays. Who in the world celebrates a birthday thinking of some type of paganism? Nobody. Even pagans who do pagan stuff don't do birthdays with the knee of paganism. They go to the woods and do whatever they do. They don't do birthdays. Rituals of paganism are gone. By the way, I don't, I don't even know if it is true because to be brutally honest, a lot of times these fatwas, they find hodgepodge type of things and they bring them in. Academic studies need to be done that are a little bit more thorough. Is it really something that is 100% solely coming out of paganism? But even if it is, even if it is, it doesn't change the fact that it is no longer done. So those scholars who say, let's look at the origin, they will also say, for example, you cannot buy Nike. Nike is haram. It's a well-known fatwa. Why is Nike haram according to this group? Because the guy who uh, you know, uh, made Nike, where's the Nike guy who works here? Where's our Nike guy? He's not here. Huh? We have three people from Nike in our masjid, mashallah. Did you not know that? You should get free, free, free Nike gifts, alhamdulillah, as well. If you, if, you, if you know them well, they'll give you a free Nike shoe. Give them your shoe size. size. So they say Nike is haram. Why is Nike haram? Because that swoosh is the symbol of... What is the symbol of? Which one? You're the Nike guy. Yeah, see here we have the Nike guy, okay? No, don't worry. I'm not going to say it's haram. Don't worry. You can raise your hand. You should know the symbol of your own company. It is the Greek god of victory. It is the Greek god of victory. Now, to believe that somebody is going to buy Nike to venerate the Greek god of victory and to put the god on his shoe to venerate it. I mean, you tell me, does this make sense to you? But see, this is again the problem of, I mean, Allah bless all of our ulama, but I have to say, see, these types of fatwas, unfortunately, what they do they disconnect the masses from their ulama. This is the problem. They disconnect the masses from their ulama and the fatwa is baseless. It's not based in academic training of Islam. Somebody's going to put a symbol of a god on his shoe to respect the god. What, what type? So that's their fatwa. They say, khalas, it comes from there. But you see, these same people that say wearing Nike is haram, these same groups of people, they will have no problems talking about the days of the week and the days of the month, which are all venerations of gods. Sunday is the sun god. Monday, the moon god. Thursday, the god of Thor, the Nordic god. 
Wednesday is Woden, Odin, the god of the Nordics. Woden is Wednesday. Every single day of the week, and I'm not, this is the reality, look it up. Uh, the months as well. Every month, June, July, August, is veneration of somebody. It's veneration of a false god. And we are using this all the time. From their perspective, it should be haram to say Monday. But who says that? Because they can't. And so, again, because we have to look at the reality of how the culture is done, not the origin. And again, I mean, there are rituals in every single religion that have faded out and become culture, without exception. And I'll give you an example from our own culture is the Mahdi, right? The Mahdi that happens in the weddings, okay? And uh, for the non uh, Desi folks here, there's a, uh, it, is, it is mandatory in our culture, wajib. No, fard in Hanafi, fard. You cannot have, and this is something that even the most practicing ultra-conservative, the Ubandi, Salafi, Ashari, whatever, they will all do it. Doesn't matter. They will do the Mahdi. What is the Mahdi? It is a celebration where uh, henna is put in elaborate designs on the body of the, and the hand and the face and the feet of the, of the bride. Okay? Now, it is well known that the origin of the Mahdi is Vedic, Hindu practices. It is well known, look this up, that the origin is to venerate the sun by drawing symbols of the sun, that's why these intricate things are done, in the color of the sun, the yellow and whatnot, right? And the turmeric and the, all of this is done there. It is coming straight out of Vedic practices in ancient Hinduism. But even Hindus these days don't even do it with that. It's gone. And... Bangladeshis have it as well, right? The Mahdi. And Nepalis and Pakistanis and Indians. We all are doing it. And we are Sikhs, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu. It's all gone now. The ritual has lost its ritual meaning. And has become something that is cultural. So the verdict will be based on the culture and not on the origin. Mahdi's are halal. <laughs> what happens in them might be haram. That's something else. But the Mahdi itself is halal. Okay? See, that's the point. So, we look at what is going on over here. So, based on all of this, I mentioned four rules. We can summarize the issue of tashabbuh and then move on to celebrations. In reality, tashabbuh applies in two and only two scenarios. That's it. The tashabbuh that is haram, only two things. Number one, when there is something unique to a religion. And the only thing that's unique to religion is the rituals and festivals of a religious nature. Wearing a cross is a religion. Okay? Having the skull cap is a religious thing. That type of skull cap. Okay? The Buddhist um, yellowish thing. Okay? Uh, menorah is a particular religion. So that's, or going to the church or synagogue. This is a religious ritual. The Shabbo in that is clearly not something we do. And number two, when a Muslim intentionally goes out of his culture and civilization in order to feel a sense of pride in a non, uh, in a civilization or culture other than his own. This is an inferiority complex that is haram because he should take izza in his own people. Simple as that. If he happens to be of those people, like the Prophet was Arab, like we are Americans... There is no tashabbuh when we dress like our own people. We're not going out of our way to dress like some, somebody else in order. And also, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, even if a Muslim were to be visiting their lands, he's not doing it to get izzah, he's doing it to get by through customs without being pulled aside, being dressed in a thobe and a turban or something. No problem there, Islam's not that strict. This is Ibn Taymiyyah writing, the same guy who wrote two volumes on Iqtiraz al-Mustaqim. But again, his followers don't really read him, they cut and paste from him. They don't read him, as I, I criticize those groups of people that they only read Ibn Taymiyyah, they don't think Ibn Taymiyyah, they just, you know, they don't really understand Ibn Taymiyyah. In any case, so now we get to, after all of this, the conclusions of the actual Eids, okay? So, with that very necessary prelude of Tashabbuh, we get to the issue of celebrations, Eid. And we'll mention four, um, four aspects. Number one, celebrating a celebration yourself. 
celebrating a celebration yourself. There are four types of celebrations. The first, any celebration that is personal and private. That is something that is not communal and something that is not religious. Any personal or private celebration that is nothing to do with the religion has nothing to do with Islam. Islam is not making it haram or halal or makruh or mubah. The celebration is neutral. The Sharia did not dictate personal celebrations. There's nothing in the Sharia that dictates anything about personal celebrations. The ahadith about Allah substituting two Eids, as we're going to come to, if anything, it is a communal. A personal celebration cannot be a bid'ah because there's no religion involved. And the Sharia did not dictate when you can be happy and when you can throw a party and invite friends over. There's nothing in the Sharia for or against this. It is neutral. So if you graduate and you want to have a festival, go ahead. If you get a new house, you want a festival, go ahead. If you're bored and you want to have a festival, go ahead. If you think it is the day you were born or whatever, your birthday, and you want to have a festival, go ahead. The Sharia is not telling you anything about this. There's nothing in and of itself that forbids it. And therefore, these personal celebrations, and in particular the two most famous ones are uh, birthdays and anniversaries, there is nothing in the Sharia to forbid them. Now, the group says it is bid'ah. We say, with utmost respect, this is the weakest argument. It cannot be bid'ah because when you celebrate the birthday of your five-year-old kid, do you expect Allah to reward you for that? Is it a part of the religion? No. You have not understood the meaning of bid'ah with my utmost respect, even though you might be more knowledgeable than me. And the million one feels it can't be bid'ah. This is just wrong. Number two, they're going to say, oh, this is tashabbu with the kuffar. So we got rid of the issue as bid'ah. They'll say number two is tashabbu with the kuffar. Well, we already, we already explained in a lot of detail that there can be no tashabbu when it is something that is done by large groups of people transcending any civilization. And we said that even if the origin was pagan, if nobody is understanding paganism and it is a generic ritual, there is no tashabbu. So, tashabbu cannot be there. There is no tashabbu in eating hamburgers and french fries. There's no tashabbu in liking cheesecake. There's no tashabbu in dressing like this, in speaking English. There is no tashabbu in celebrating birthdays. Cannot be tashabbu. We understood this point with that. Then they say, oh, but... The origin is pagan, we already explained. The origin is pagan means nothing. Because Tuesday is also pagan. And we all know what Tuesday is, okay? Then they say, oh, but birthdays and anniversaries have intermixing and sharab and haram things. What do we say to this? Drink water. <laughs> Don't make something haram because of something that is obviously haram in something else. Don't mix and match. Don't pick and choose like this way, okay? Make it halal, keep it halal, then do that. Then they say, oh, but there's israf and waste of money. To which we say, who amongst us is safe from that? Why are you picking and choosing this one battle and ignoring the israf in your wardrobe? The israf in going out to restaurants, the israf in this and that. And then you want to prohibit the five-year-old birthday, five-year-old child's birthday and say, this is israf. Be fair. Birthdays are halal because there's nothing to make them haram. Is that clear? The default, everything is halal. You have to prove it's haram. And anything they throw at you, and I've been saying this for more than a decade, is nothing new if you're hearing from me, but because people are so sensitive in this regard, it cannot be tashabbu. And it's ironic you're speaking to me in English, wearing pant and shirt, living in America, and you're talking about birthdays being tashabbu. What do you, I mean, again, think about this. It's not tashabbu. It's a generic thing that everybody is doing. It's nothing to do with any uh, paganism. On top of this, on top of this, Certain types of these celebrations can actually bring a positive goal that the Sharia wants, love between families. Anniversaries are of the most easiest ways to win your wife's heart back, mashallah tabarakallah. Please don't forget your anniversaries, right? I, I say it is sunnah, meaning 
meaning not sunnah like sunnah here meaning the goals of the sharia sunnah not the prophet sunnah obviously it is of the goals of the sharia to celebrate your anniversary quote me on that no problem it is of the goals of the sharia to celebrate your anniversary why not of the goals of the sharia to bring love between a couple and allah created women that way they love these dates us we don't even think about the dates that's the problem right Make sure you put the date in your calendar 10 times. Like, put it right now, like whatever is your anniversary, make there. And then, surprise, go out, have a nice party, do something halal, obviously, no sharab. Just drink some, some grape juice, no problem. Keep it halal. But celebrate, why not? What is wrong? How can the sharia forbid a celebration between a husband and wife that will increase their love? Think about, again, those ulama that make a haram based on what? So, we say all of this is completely. There's no basis to make it haram. طيب. We talked about the four types of celebration. Number one, personal celebrations. Number two, celebrations that are of a communal nature but are non-religious. Fourth of July or national days in Muslim lands or whatnot. So a group of scholars say that it is haram, again, as we, as we said. And they quote the hadith, Allah has given you two days better than those two days. I understand where they're coming from, and frankly, let me be frank here, when it comes to joint communal civilizational holidays, they have a better point because the hadith can be understood to apply to communal holidays. The hadith of Allah has given you two Eids better than those two Eids cannot be used for birthdays because it's not an Eid where people come together. It's your personal house or your whatever. I mean, you get my It's not a communal holiday which is an Eid. It's not the gathering of people. It's the gathering of your friends. A national, secular day, I can understand the argument. Nonetheless, and therefore some ulama say haram, other ulama say makruh, and that makes sense to me. And yet others say that in and of itself, as long as there's no religion involved, it cannot be bid'ah because there's no religion, right? And if it is done for any other goal or whatnot, it becomes mubah or whatnot, or maybe even makruh. But the point is, to argue that it is haram is simply a big word. Where did you get haram from? Even the hadith, Allah has substituted your two days for two better days, does not indicate tahrim. Substitution does not indicate tahrim. If the Prophet had wanted to, he could have said very easily, Allah has forbidden any Eids other than our two Eids. And that would have, in that wording, we could have forbidden any national secular holiday. That wording, but he didn't. He talked about two religious festivals of Jahiliyyah, and he said those two religious festivals, get rid of them. And Allah has given you two better religious festivals. So religious festivals, we already agree, we're going to come to this as well. So, bottom line, generic and, and by the way, we're talking about you celebrating, meaning you doing it. If you are the president of the country, should you endorse a secular? This is what we're talking about. We're going to come to number two, which is attending. We don't do the 4th of July. We are, we are witnessing. There's a difference between the two. We don't do Thanksgiving. We're witnessing. There's a difference. We're talking about you instituting that. Maybe it's makru. Maybe it's mubah. Definitely not haram. And definitely not wajib. Okay? We can eliminate those two. Makru to mubah is where I would say a secular holiday, you instituting it. Okay? Number three, a holiday that is uniquely religious. Here we have no problem saying this is where the sharia says, no. We do not celebrate Diwali. We do not celebrate a festival to another god. And we do not celebrate Christmas as Muslims, we do not institute those celebrations. We don't bring the tree into our house and hang, but we don't do that. It's not our religion to do that. That's what they do. We have ours. So clearly that's religious celebrations. It is haram. Number four is a celebration that is in between two and three. That's the problem. Okay. Or one and three. Little bit of this, little bit of that. Such as Thanksgiving, such as Halloween. It's not clear cut secular, 4th of July. And it's not clear cut. Well, I said Thanksgiving. Sorry, let me take that back. Thanksgiving, I would say is secular. Sorry, let me take that back. Because Thanksgiving, there's no, there's no particular religion per se. I, that was a mistake, a slip of the tongue. I didn't mean to say Thanksgiving. Halloween is the example I have in mind. 
Because Halloween clearly has certain religious connotations. And it was meant as a religious festival. And to this day, segments of mankind celebrate that day as a religious festival. To this day. Not only that, but the issue comes of intentionally wanting to dress like shayateen and whatnot. And there, it's not clear cut because, you know, 99% of the people who celebrate Halloween have no religion in mind. But that 1% is there, and there is that connotation with shayateen and whatnot. And really, because of this, I cannot say clear cut haram, and I cannot say clear cut mubah. It's something that is. And here's another question. We gave the example of Halloween. But in some lands, and I predict in America even in 50 years, Halloween might become a secular festival. When it does, there is no question that the ruling will be based upon how people perceive, perceive it and now, and not how its origins were. But right now, right now Christmas is a, Christmas is a religious festival. Right now, by and large, still in America, by the way. I mean, Europe is different. Some places of Europe is already becoming secular. Okay. Huh? Oh, no, no. I meant Christmas. Sorry. Take that back. Christmas. I, I meant Christmas. Christmas is category three. In 50 years, Christmas might become category two, is what I meant to say. Scrap that. Scrap that. Rewind. I was saying that right now, Halloween is category four. Christmas is category three. Is that clear? Category three is pure religion. Four is vague. Maybe in 50 years, Christmas might become another category. That's what I'm saying. When it does, then the ruling will be based upon that. If a time comes when Christmas no longer has anything to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, just like the Mahdi no longer celebrates the sun, our sisters did not even know until I said to them that this is celebrating the sun God. Didn't even know it. And I know some of them are going to feel guilty when they do it, but they don't need to feel guilty. Nothing to feel guilty about. It's no big deal. So if Christmas were to leave all Christian connotations, and it seems like that's heading that way, then at that time, the verdict will be different for Christmas. And in the interim, there's going to be a gray area that we are currently seeing. So this is the first thing, you celebrating. The second thing, you attending the celebration. You witnessing the celebration. This is much more easier. Because you are not doing it, you are seeing it. And attending so we're talking about now only religious because we already said personal private nothing of the sharia ah. going to birthday parties nothing wrong with this nothing the sharia ah has nothing to do with that unless the haram is going on there then it, it's to do with the haram now with the birthday party so we're talking about attending religious festivals now there are a number of athar of the tabi'un and the salaf that discouraged attending festivals and they even interpreted a verse of the quran walladhina la yashhaduna zur they don't attend religious festivals and there's no question that muslims should not be going to holy sites and participating in rituals of other faith traditions there is no question about this we do not go to the ganges river how the disgusting you know, um, things happen there as we know. They burn bodies and they leave them there, you know. It's filth for us, najis, and, uh, and that thing is very, not very clean. We do not go and dip ourselves thinking it's going to be holy, do we? We don't do that, okay? We don't go to a temple and give puja to the gods. A'udhu billah. So to go on their holy day, of course, is not going to be something we do. So that's very clear. We do not go to the festival locations. However, how about going to family festivals that are meant to be in reminiscent of the religious one? Going to a church on Christmas to celebrate you know, the festival religiously is not the same as going to a family's house that is having a family event. Okay, Not the same thing. How about going to that family event? There is no question that Muslims should not institute these festivals in their houses. We said this. And generally speaking generally speaking we should avoid these types of festivals even on a private scale because they are primarily religious still but a number of our scholars and this is amja which is a very conservative body have also said that if a convert wants to attend the festival of their family on that day their ruling is not the ruling of the muslim born and raised here and he's making a christmas in his house big difference between the two a convert 
That's the one day of the year their whole family comes together, right? Your second cousin and your third aunt twice removed and your Matilda aunt, whatever they come, that's the one day of the year they're all going to come from across the country and they're going to sit together and you're the only Muslim. What a great opportunity to be yourself and show them who you are. It is foolish to forbid a convert to go to their family's festival but with the condition that they don't participate in in what? in the actual ritual and the fatwa is from Amja and many bodies that the convert can go to their personal now how about office festivals office festivals are not religious even if they occur around religious holidays and everybody who works in an office knows this only some ulama who have never worked in corporate America think otherwise brutally honest I'm just being anybody who works in the real world knows that festivals at Christmas time in your office have nothing to do with Christmas even if the icons are there, but Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, agnostics, it is a festival of the office. It's not worshipping Jesus Christ. So there's nothing wrong with you being in that environment, and there are no rituals. It's not even allowed in America for them to have rituals on the employees over there. You can actually, you know, take cause them into um, trouble. So no problem being a part of a generic festival that happens to coincide with their one that is not religious is that clear and Imam Ahmed very strict alim generally speaking great scholar said and this is in the book of Khalal via the Muhanna about witnessing Christian celebrations by going to the bazaar there's a Christian celebration going on the bazaar is a festive place there's going to be you know things going on whatever you can imagine jugglers whatever going and witnessing Imam Ahmed said if they're in the bazaar and they don't go to the church I don't see a problem with that this is Imam Ahmed. Fireworks on the 4th of July, not even religion. Nothing wrong with that, okay? We are walking in the bazaar and the Macy's parade is going on on the 25th or they have the tree. And you say, oh, just the tree and the light. You're just looking at it. Nothing wrong with that per se. You're just seeing it. You're not being a part of the, of the ritual. And in fact, we can even say, therefore, there's nothing wrong with taking advantage of Christmas sales. No problem. Lich Islamically, there's no problem. And Imam Ahmad was asked about this. He said, you can buy. Ibn Taymiyyah was said, you can buy on their holy days. Ibn Taymiyyah was a big strict. strict. He said, don't sell to them on their holy days. Because he was, in his mind, he was saying, if you sell, they're going to use it in their shirk. But in these days, who does that anymore? So anyway, that was his fatwa in this regard. Tayyip, so that's attending a festival. Number three, congratulating them on their festival. I know we're late, inshallah, we'll be done in 10 minutes. But this is, as you know, a very important lecture. And it needs to be given. Number three, congratulating them on their celebrations. There is nothing explicit from the Quran and Sunnah or any of the four Imams that allows or forbids congratulating them on their um, celebrations. Um, Ibn al Qayyim, in his famous uh, book, Ahkam Ahl Dhimma, he has a very harsh comment in which he says that, and he's against this, he says that to congratulate them for their celebrations is worse than congratulating them for drinking or congratulating them for committing murder. Because he views it as shirk, the celebration. So if you're congratulating them for their shirk, then you are congratulating them for a sin that is worse than drinking and murder. Okay. Now this is what Ibn Qayyim wrote. Um, a few years ago, some adolescent simpleton neophyte on YouTube, these, these overzealous youngsters, he's, in his fiery voice he said, Ibn Al-Qayyim says... That celebrating, no, what do you say? Saying Merry Christmas is worse than murder. And that YouTube clip went viral across the internet. And like, it's this, you know, even Ibn Qayyim and Taymiyyah, their own followers have done more damage to them than anything they themselves have ever done. Their own followers are just so in their own bubble and whatnot. Ibn Qayyim did not say that. Ibn Qayyim wrote a very precise, and I actually had to clarify and, and, and you know, um, explain that to defend Ibn al-Qayyim, even if I politely disagree with Ibn al-Qayyim, but Ibn al-Qayyim is very academic. He did not say saying Merry Christmas is worse than murder. He said congratulating them for their holy days is worse than congratulating them for khamr and murder. There's a big difference between the two, right? And this neophyte just literally, anyway, so 
you you know my <coughs> anyway. So where was I? Um, so yes. So Ibn Qayyim definitely says you should not congratulate them for their. And, and, and you know I understand. It makes sense. Listen to the logic. It's very straightforward. They say that believing in another god is shirk, is paganism. It's the worst of all sins. And what is a holy day other than venerating that other god, whatever that god might be? Hence, they say, to congratulate them on their festival is essentially congratulating them on their belief in another god and worshipping another god. So it is a logically constructed argument. It's not far left field. And we respect that argument. We say, okay, you have made a valid point. Do realize that it is one opinion. And there are many scholars who basically agree with the first bit, which is to celebrate, to worship another god is shirk. And they agree with the second bit, to celebrate that god is also wrong. But they disagree with the third bit, which is to wish somebody a good celebration does not mean that you are endorsing the first two. You see, this is where the disconnect comes, right? And this is the standard fatwa from most of our scholars outside of that one school of thought. You know, scholars from Azhar, from Jordan, from many of the other. Uh, and even I know, I know for a fact within the Deobandi tradition as well, there are two schools within this. And some of the Deobandis allow it and some of them uh, don't allow it as well. And one of the things that they mention is that it is well known in multicultural settings that non-Muslims wish us happy Eids as well. And they don't think that their Christianity is compromised when they say happy Eid to us. They understand that wishing somebody happy Eid doesn't mean that they're now all of a sudden Muslim. It's just a generic statement that they say. And they also quote the scholars that allow this. They quote from the Salaf and from Imam Ahmad and others who basically said that it is allowed to wish for something good for the kafir in this world. May you have good life. May you have good children. So they make a generic dua, it's halal. So they say if it's allowed to make a generic dua any day, why can't you say it? on the day that they're extra happy. You see, they just make an argument like this. And they also say, Allah says in the Quran, when somebody greets you, then you should greet back the same or better. So if somebody says happy Eid to you on your Eid day, why shouldn't you also wish them, you know, a happy, holy, whatever day that they have. Now, I, and that's a good argument to make. I will say, without deciding which one is right and wrong, let's get out of the khilaf and instead of saying Merry Christmas, even though I'm not saying it is haram and I'm not saying it is halal, I am just silent about that right now. But uh, instead of saying Merry Christmas, why don't we get out of the khilaf and use a generic greeting? Use a generic greeting. May God bless you. Okay? Happy holiday. Good day to you. Whatever. It's your generic greeting. Just use your generic greeting so that you get out of the khilaf of group one. Okay, because look, I'm gonna be honest. It's a, it is a logical argument. It's not coming out of again nowhere. It's a logical argument. Why would you wish a particular holy day? Just be generic, happy season or whatever. You know, you get my point. You're just a generic greeting, and you get out of the khilaf. And you know, it reminds me of something Ibn Abbas said. Ibn Abbas said, Ibn Abbas. He said, if Fir'aun said to me, Barakallahu fiq, I would say, Wa Barakallahu fiq. If Fir'aun said to me, may Allah bless you, I would make dua, may Allah bless you. Why, why shouldn't I make dua for somebody? Why shouldn't I make some positive statement for him? May Allah bless you. Okay. So if somebody wishes you something, you know, and you say, say yes, you know, and, and God bless you. And you know, for us, God bless you is good because God bless you with everything, including Hidayah. God bless you. Bismillah. You know, make a dua. God bless you. Yes, God bless you with good health, good life, with guidance, everything. God bless you. What's the problem with that? You should not be any problem whatsoever. So, the third thing we said is to greetings. And we said, I'm not saying haram. I'm not saying halal. I'm just saying get out and just say, you know, generic. Final thing, then we're done. Accepting gifts because of the celebration. Accepting gifts because of the celebration. Your neighbor gifts you on Christmas. Okay? Can you accept that gift or not? Ali radiallahu an. Ali, the famous Ali, radiallahu anhu, was living in Kufa. And Kufa was a land of Zoroastrians at that time. Muslims have come. And one day, he was gifted something. In the Arabic books, it's called Faludaj. All the Desis know what Faludaj is. But your Faludaj is not their Faludaj. They didn't have vanilla ice cream in their Faludaj. Okay? Tutti frutti, okay. <laughs> 
So uh, he was gifted something called faludaj, and he had never gotten it before. It was a mixture of conco. It was a faludaj, one thousand four hundred years old. So go back. Our modern faludaj is generated from that. Okay. Uh, the Arabs have no idea faludaj, right? You guys don't know where the Arabs. You have no idea, right? Okay. This is in the books of Arabic uh, hadith. He was gifted faludaj. Faludaj is still in our cultures. Okay, it's a very nice sweet, but in our time, it is ice cream and other things mixed up. But of course, back then it was different. He loved it, mashallah, tabarakallah. So he said, what is the occasion? Why am I gifted this faludaj? They said, it is no ruse for us. Ali radiallahu anh, man of my heart, he said, may every day be your no ruse. <laughs> <laughs> what does this show? He liked Faluda, yes. <laughs> What's the problem in getting gifts on their day? This is Ali radiallahu anhu. May every day be Falu. <laughs> Let me get some more, okay? Someone came to Aish radiallahu anhu, our mother. And she said, we have some Zoroastrian neighbors. And they gift us on their Eid. Can we accept their gifts? Aisha said, anything they sacrificed on that day, do not eat but you may eat of their fruits and their plants. Now, why can you not eat the sacrifice of Zoroastrians? Because they're not Ahli Kitab. Not because it is holiday. Because she said, eat of the others, right? Laddu bhejan khalu, koi baat nahi, bismillah. Okay? The Hindu says the laddu, eat the laddu. Eat the laddu, this is exactly what the athar is, exactly what the athar is, right? The Zoroastrian is sending on his holy day food. Aisha said, if there's meat, this is Zoroastrian. But anything else on the plate, go ahead and eat it. Right? And of course, the point is that, that, that meat is not halal for us to eat. And so that's like that. Uh, Abu Burza as well, he would say the same thing. He was living among the uh, Sahabi, Abu Burza al-Aslami. He was living amongst the Zoroastrians. I mean, like when Islam was conquering Persia. And he told his family as well on the day of Nowruz that anything that comes of meat, do not eat. But anything else, you may eat of it. So the same ruling. Coming on Nowruz, but you may eat of it. Therefore, anything that they gift us on that day that's generically halal, we may take it. And the generic will, when we are gifted, we gift back. So if we give back on our Eid, or even if it's the same day, in, in and of itself, there should be no problem. And especially if it's in an office environment, which isn't even a ritual. A lot of you ask me about the office gift. It's not even a ritual, Aslan. No big deal. So with this, inshallah ta'ala, we summarize by stating that Unfortunately, it appears that some ulama, may Allah Azza wa reward them for their ikhlas and their sincerity and their desire to protect Islam. In their desire to protect Islam, they wanted to make certain things haram. And also because these things might have been haram at certain times and places. However, there is no strong basis to consider these things haram. In particular, festivals and celebrations of a generic nature. What is haram are uniquely religious festivals and celebrations that are meant to venerate other gods. And these are things we do not do as Muslims. But if we happen to witness them third hand, we see the fireworks, we do in and of themselves, this is halal. And if people gift us things on that day as well, it is halal as long as the object itself is halal. And we may give generic greetings to our friends and neighbors on that day. And it's probably safe to avoid specific greetings when it comes to the actual day of the, the name of the festival. It's probably best to do that. Uh, and there's nothing in the Sharia ah that encourages or discourages personal celebrations. It's between you and Allah. Allah did not dictate. It's not something the Sharia ah came with to dictate your personal private celebrations. There is no Quran and Sunnah to allow or deny. Therefore, the default is that it is halal. Things are halal unless the proof comes otherwise. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, time is way too late. Tomorrow is Thursday. We will have the Q&A tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, after Salat al-Isha for this very topic. So come tomorrow for Salat al-Isha. We'll have the Q&A for that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa rahma ba'd. So for those of you who attended yesterday's halaqa, inshallah, we can begin the Q&A. So who has the first question from yesterday's halaqa? Bismillah, yes.
You know, the problem comes with these other haram items. As I said, we differentiate between the religious festivals that involve rituals and between the religious festivals that involve happiness but no rituals. And the rituals that are dedicated to worshipping other than Allah have a severe level of prohibition. And it is the position that I advocated yesterday, as Imam Ahmed said, that if you're going to go to the bazaar and look at the festival there, okay, but don't go to the synagogue or the church. So if there is a happy festival that is around their holy festival, such as in your office there's the Christmas party that takes place, or on campus there's the Diwali group taking place, the haram issue doesn't is not just to look at the celebration. The haram issue is what happens there. And in this case, there's going to be dancing and there's going to be suggestive dancing. So even if it wasn't Diwali, it wouldn't be appropriate for a Muslim to attend. So the issue is not that it is coinciding with Diwali. If they were to have a generic Diwali festival with balloons and you know things, there's nothing wrong for him to just look and see what's going on. Like for example, there's the, you know, the parade that takes place over here. Uh, in some cities, there's a parade, uh, Christmas parade, Thanksgiving parade, whatnot, uh, or 4th of July. Uh, 4th of July is a secular already said, but even those who said it is haram to do it, whatnot, they didn't differentiate between doing and between seeing. And there's a big difference between you looking at the festivities versus you participating in the festivities. So the issue comes in this case, what takes place? and not the fact that they're having a festive occasion. Is that clear? Okay, any other questions? Yeah. No, again, this is, this, is, this is a complex thing. So they have brought horses to your you know, workplace or whatnot. And they're saying, come on, everybody, go ride the horses. You know, that's what they... So if they're asking you to participate in the actual prayer, because see, look, there's two separate elements here. There's the element of happiness and joy. There's going to be free coffee. There's going to be hay rides for the kids is going to be that's not a problem but if you are a part of the uh, the the actual I mean here we get to this gray area so this is a gray area this isn't a ritual per se it's not a ritual what is clearly haram is the ritual that is no question about that this parade as I said Imam Ahmed's statement is very clear the, 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 the person is asking can I go to the bazaar and see and the point was, there is festivities in the bazaar, right? And there's nothing wrong, therefore, it's your community, and the kids like to see, you like to see. Seeing is not endorsing, and, and, and generally, almost everything that happens there is not related to rituals. They don't do rituals in the bazaar. But there's going to be whiffs of the ritual. Like you said, Santa Claus is there, and this is there. So my advice to you is to not dive in the deep end. But if you see the ambience and whatnot, we shouldn't be that strict. You know, uh, Umm Salama, for example, it's not directly related, but still it is related. That Umm Salama, and of course she was in Abyssinia for many years, as you know, married to Abu Salama, I remember. And when she came to Medina, she was in awe at the churches she had seen. They had never seen stained glass. They had never seen magnificent monuments, right? And so she was describing in wonder and amazement, which means she went inside the church. And she's seeing everything there, right? And she's telling the Prophet ﷺ. And it's human nature. We want to see these magnificent buildings and we're struck and all. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell her, A'udhu Billah, how could you have walked into the church? A'udhu Billah, didn't you fear? He didn't tell her this. So, unfortunately, sometimes we make Islam more difficult. You know my position in this regard. There's nothing wrong with just looking at what's going on. But now if you're going to be asked to build a church, now that's a different thing. To paint the stained glass, that's a different thing. You see what I'm saying? And there should be a reasonable amount of distance. So I would be hesitant. I'm not saying it's haram. Haram is a big word. 
I would be hesitant for you to participate in the actual uh, you know, parade itself. Because in the end of the day, there are going to be those icons. There might be a cross somewhere. And you know, why would you then be in that particular line? You see? So there are levels, inshallah. Okay? Yes, Mr. Mitchell. We already said this is okay. You were here yesterday. We didn't over this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what? But what exactly is it? It's a twenty-five dollar gift that everybody gives everybody. There's no ritual here, and you have to participate simply because it's etiquette. How rude is it to say I'm not going to participate? There are Buddhists. There are atheists. There are agnostics. There is no ritual there. Right? So it's a matter of adab. Now, I wouldn't institute it if you were the CEO of the company. I'd say, then do something else, you know? Or I would say, do it on Eid. So you say, okay, we have this. But you're not the CEO of the company, inshallah. One day you will be. I'll make dua, inshallah. One day you'll be the CEO of the company, inshallah. But until you are, what are you going to do? You know, I got an email today that the sisters like said that uh, I, I, last year I said no, and the whole office was like, what, you know, why would you not participate in? What's the big deal? So she was very concerned. Like I said, what do I do this year? I said, go ahead. No big deal. There's no ritual involved in gift exchange. Okay, Bismillah. Go ahead. Anybody else? Bismillah. You are, go ahead. Wait, 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 wait. I don't think. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think the actual fruits that are offered to the God are taken out of the temple and given to strangers outside. From what I know, from what I know, they give it. They give it to the priests and the visitors of the temple. No, not just that, but as a matter of ritual themselves, that this is not like your average offering. This is something given. This is not giving gifts on the day of. This is giving gifts to the gods. So unless your colleague has some high place in the temple, she has access to that, then it makes sense that if she is that type. So in that case, that which was offered to the gods should not be touched. Okay? Because that was consecrated to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is separate than giving sweets on the holy day. You see? So if you know, and, and by the way, that's rare. Agree, but that's rare. It's very rare. Yeah, so this is the thing. She's involved with that, then yes. Okay, that's, then you should not do that. Okay, yes, go ahead. Outside of Christmas time, so, so no, look, look, look. So if it is associated with Christmas, like the Christmas tree, the Christmas tree is associated with Christmas. It is the icon of Christmas. Here we do get the issue of tashabbu, because we said yesterday, what the, when does tashabbu occur? When it is unique to the religion or even a civilization not your own, and you go out of here like, why would a Muslim want to have a Christmas tree? There is an element of wanting to be like the, the other group. The least that can be said if it's not shirk is haram, clearly, right? But generic lights, I don't think if I see a light that's green and blue, I don't automatically think of Christmas if I see it outside of Christmas. You see, so let's be a little bit more specific here. And if you get lights on sale and you just put them outside your house or eat day or something like that, you know, I mean, I don't see a problem with this. But to, I mean, to somebody asked me yesterday about decorating around Christmas, I said, no, it should not be done. Because you may decorate your house at any time, but for a Muslim to do it around Christmas, it is an indication that, you know, it's not our festival. As we said, we don't celebrate this festival, but we may observe. So if we pass by somebody's house, let's say, and they have beautiful ornaments right now, okay? So you have some strict parents, they speed up the car. Children, lower that, lower the gaze. Huh? Don't look at the lights. Okay, Umm Salam, I said, I saw that beautiful stained glass. Did the process and say, don't look at it. I mean, again, sometimes you get these ultra strict ulama. As I said, I'm very, very critical of them. 
just like I'm critical of progressive because I think both of them are harming the religion in their own way. The religion is livable. It is an easy religion. I mean, you teach your children. I teach my children this. Like, look, this is Christmas. You know, uh, we don't celebrate it. And they believe this and that. And that's their festival. We'll celebrate on Eid. We'll do something. End of story. That's it. I mean, what more difficult is that? Even the four-year-old understands that, okay, that's their, we have our Eid, they have their, so, it's, so they can admire that light. But now, should you put lights on your house? No, why should you? Should you put that tree in your house? Of course not. Because then you are tacitly getting involved, and that's not our celebration. Okay? Other questions? No. No, 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 no. They, the blessing that they give is a generic blessing. This is not consecrating to a false god. Christians, as a, a, that's their rituals anyway. It's not just on Christmas. If you go to a religious Christian's house, you will not start eating until they say grace and whatnot. Okay? This is not dedicating the food to other than God. This is just their alhamdulillah. Right? This, we have to be careful here. Christians do not consecrate food to other than God like Hindus do, like other religions do. So, yeah, so it doesn't ruin the food there. You, you stick aside there. You don't hold hands and what. I say, I'm a Muslim. You guys do that. Okay, you say your blessing. No problem. Say alhamdulillah. Recite, recite, billah minash shaitan rajeem. Okay, keep on saying that, okay? Yeah, Surah Fatiha. Okay. Excellent. So now you're okay, sir. Yeah, say, yeah, and so you just give a generic. We thank God for for all that He has blessed us, and you know, we, you can just give the generic stuff. Excellent. Alhamdulillah. They, there's not going to be any rituals in this country. Don't worry. Yeah, what about Yeah, that is an issue now. So you are an employee, and as a part of your job you're going to be asked to put up these decorations, right? Um, I see that. That's a, a, that is uh, obviously a more problematic area. Well, no, in a Muslim business, no, no, in a Muslim business, in a Muslim business, it does make it easier because even if he wants to do that, you know, you give him your nasiha, you say, look, get the other employee to do that. It's like, huh? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, tell him to come speak with me, then I'll, I'll get you off. But in a serious note, if it's a non-Muslim and he's asking you to do this, if you are able to get another employee and you basically do favors for that, like, look, I'll do a shift of yours if you do this or whatnot. I mean, there are ways, you know this, we all know this, you know what I'm saying? If you're able to, alhamdulillah, if not, then I honestly say, I don't see this as being haram or shirk in and of itself because, again, this is not rituals. Again, my point is, most of the fat fatwas you read are a little bit superficial. They just lump everything together. But it is not the case. If you were asked to build a church, it's not the same as your generic warehouse employee saying, hang the lights here. You see? If you were asked to hammer a cross inside the church, that's a big difference. And I say, no, it is not allowed for a Muslim to be employed to build a temple you know, for other than Allah. Okay, that's not our job to, 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 to do that. But in this case, your employer has a generic place, a house, I mean a, a warehouse or whatever, and you're just being asked to put up these various decorations. It is not a ritual, it is the festivity spirit of the season, and it should be avoided. But if you are indeed forced to do so, in that you might be the only employee, right? And it's very, I mean, in this country, these types of you know, minimum wages, you're going to get fired. You know this. You know this. I don't think this is a fight that needs to be done for the sake of Allah. He's not asking you to drink wine. He's not asking you to commit shirk. If those were the case, then yes, you get fired rather than... But this is not one of those things that you really need to stand your ground for, for what... I mean, I don't see this as being to that level. Is that clear? Right? So if you're asked to do it and you have no alternative, then Bismillah, inshallah. Let's go back all the way. Anybody from this side? Sisters, nobody. I, I see you, don't worry. I know, inshallah. So go ahead, yeah. No prohibition. There's no prohibition. But the question arises, should you do this for no reason? Let's flip it around. Right? 
there is no specific prohibition. And we have to realize in Mecca, there were temples everywhere. The Kaaba itself, even though the Kaaba is holy, so it has a separate thing, but the Kaaba had 360 idols. You know, the process of doing tawaf, he sees these idols. What are you going to do now? Obviously, Mecca is holy anyway. But the point, point is, there's no, there's no explicit prohibition to, wo- to go to a temple. The, the prohibition primarily is upon, obviously, the participating in the ritual. But I will push back a little bit and say, even if there isn't an explicit prohibition, why should a Muslim want to go there for no reason? If there is a reason, and reasons can be trivial. Umm Salama wants to see the beautiful thing, right? And maybe most likely she must be going off ritual time. Just like when we visit churches, typically we will not be going during ritual time. We're going during off time. Number one. Number two, the other reason is that, you know, your, your, your colleague has passed away or his mother or whatever. And you go as your token of condolence, right? So you show your face, you show your colleagues, I came. And you give your condolences and you leave. There's no prohibition to walk into another temple. Nothing in the Quran Sunnah. Yeah, I mean, I have seen go walked in as well. I mean, I walk into old, 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 you know, churches. I mean, again, it is you are not participating. You're not validating their system. You're simply looking at the architecture. And yeah, and, you know, I don't see this as a haraj. Now, some scholars do find this problematic. And again, I see where they're coming from. But I'll be honest, I've done it, and I will do it again if, I, if there's a need to do so. I mean, especially the old churches of Europe, whatever. I've been to so many. I've been to, and I'm going to Bethlehem. Most likely, if there's time, I'm going to go to the you know, Church of Nativity again. I've been there you know, two times. I'll go again. It's an interesting church to see. And to me, I like to see the Christian people more than the <laughs> architecture. I personally benefit just to see it and whatnot. It's a sign for me. You know? So I go to the Church of Nativity itself, which is the holiest of holy churches. You know, I haven't actually been in the line to go see where they say Jesus was crucified or whatnot. Um, there's a line that's like two hours or an hour and a half long, especially in this season. Um, the, in this season of the Christmas season, literally the line is like any outside the church. But you can just walk in and see the church and walk out. There's no line for that. But if you want to go into the chamber, uh, I haven't been there. But I'll be honest with you. If I got the opportunity, I would walk in and see. I don't see any problem in I mean, just seeing. I want to see what's going on. Maybe that's where the Garden of Gethsemane was. I don't know. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. For me, it's just a historical relic. I, it doesn't affect my iman. I don't approve of what they might be doing or not. But it's a curiosity for me. I don't see a problem with that. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. No, if this is again, you are not. You are not the one doing it. Everybody's the it's being done to them. So, as soon as the the the, the festival finishes, you be the first one to take it off. No problem. Right? I don't think it's problematic that they do it. Okay, sister, you have a question in the back. I saw a hand raised. The question is gone. Okay, back. Bismillah. His name. So uh, v- Valentine's is clearly not a religious one. We went well, we over the issue, even if it's pagan in origin, if it's gone, it's gone. So Valentine's is neither, there's no religious element involved. The problem, of course, comes, which is obvious here, that if uh, this is happening between a couple before marriage, then that is the problem. That obviously we do not, we do not incite passions and flirtations before marriage. Okay, this is not something that is done. Uh, and obviously, Valentine's has that token. But if a couple, married couple, um, and, and, and you know, maybe you and I don't understand this because we grew up in a different culture, but maybe converts, for example, who every year chose Valentine's before they became Muslim, okay? Then they converted to Islam, and they kept on doing something special on Valentine's. A very realistic example, okay? For them, for example, should we tell them it is haram for you to do something on Valentine's? See, me and you, most of us here, for you know, 14th February is like, doesn't nothing happens? We didn't grow up like that, okay? But do realize we have to look at hukum shari beyond me and you. 
the hukum shar'i, the Islamic ruling is beyond my culture and your culture. If there are people for whom this was a day of expressing love, there's no religion, there's no ritual, right? It is a purely a religious holiday. And we mentioned yesterday, personal, private, a religious holidays, the sharia has not come to prohibit it. You may do whatever you want as long as it is within the confines of the sharia. So if a couple wishes to do something special, go out, you know, this and that, there's no problem. If they want to decorate or throw cards or whatever, all of this, the, the sharia would not prohibit it. Okay? So, generally speaking, mainstream Muslims invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and send salat upon the Prophet uh, That's not a problem. There are some fringe, extreme Sufi groups, uh, especially those that are involved with veneration of graves to a very abnormal level. Amongst that group of people, they do essentially what Hindus do to their idols, they do to those graves and they will dedicate food to the graves and they will give sweets to the qabr itself and obviously who eats those sweets they themselves do the people around them do right so i would apply i'm not calling them hindus but i will apply the same ruling to those food items because that was meant for the qabr which is different than what you're saying that there's a gathering of dhikr and there's food going to be eaten by the people and they just do a group dhikr to bless the food so tasawwuf is of levels and the more extreme mutasawwifa i mean to be brutal honest the extreme badelvis here i'm talking about their version of you know venerating the graves is a little bit beyond what i would consider within acceptability and they have the urs and they have the 40 days and they have this and that you know and they do rituals that are very similar to hinduism around the grave and we should definitely not be supporting something that is that extreme. And I would not participate and I would, and here we also have an element of da'wah as well. Like if your cousin or somebody is doing this, then you can say, look, I just don't agree with this stuff. So there's an element of da'wah, so, okay? This is the final question I have to go and get ready for tomorrow. Go ahead, Sunnah. Yes, so yesterday's class was uh, Tashabbu bil Kuffar. There's actually many categories of Tashabbu. There's Tashabbu al Rijal bil Nisa, Tashabbu al Nisa bil Rijal, uh, men imitating women, women imitating men. There's Tashabbu bil Fasiqeen, right? All those different categories of Tashabbu. Uh, and we didn't talk about it at all yesterday because that's not the topic. But one of the categories is uh, Tashabbu with people of Fisq. And in every culture and civilization since time you know, uh, immemorial, there are certain groups that are known to be troublemakers. You know, just into the drugs and the women and this and that. No. Right. They're known. It's always there. So for a Muslim to go out of his way to want to look like them is also not something that is befitting. Obviously, it's not to the level of tashabu bil kuffar. It's not to that level of tahrim. But it is still something that uh, we can discourage against at the very least. Now, we have to be careful, though, that fashion is not the same as what, what we're talking about of evil people or gangsters, let's say. Okay? And it is possible that gangster fashion becomes hip and cool, which is happening right now. Okay? Where it's no longer associated with actual evil and it because something so this is a, a a difficult area and we look at it case by case and this is an evolving area there is no doubt that much of what is halal now would have been haram at some point in time much of what is haram now might be halal in a few generations it and, and that's the gray area so we talked about examples yesterday 
of things being clear to Shabu al Kufar 200 years ago and clear cut no longer to Shabu al Kufar now. Your clothes are no longer to Shabu al Kufar. Whereas it would have been in your own society, I would say 100 years ago. Is that not correct? Your great grandfather would never have seen another person of his tribe wear what you're wearing. Is that not correct? Yeah. And if somebody at that time and place wore this, the verdict would be to Shabu. 100%. But in now, your time, it's not. Now, what happened in the interim? Did it just overnight become haram to halal? Wasn't there a period of struggle? There would have been a generation, maybe your grandfather with you, or your, you or your father, I don't know, you with your son. There's going to be a struggle generation. What are you doing? How you do that, right? And the haram is going to be slowly, slowly, slowly changed until it becomes halal. And by the way, this isn't just now. I mean, I didn't talk about, again, so much to say, time is limited. Wherever Islam went, the people kept their clothes. Think about it. Yes, the thobe did spread, but even the thobe was modified culturally. But generally speaking, wherever Islam went, so when Islam was introduced to any civilization, at that point in time, there would have been this strangeness of clothes, right? But what happened? The Indonesians have their garb, the Malay have their garb, the the, the Nigerians have their, mashallah, very ex, you know, the Pakistanis have their, every civilization, the men, not the women have their own hijabs, I'm talking about the men. They have their own clothing system. Clearly then, there must have been a time where the Muslims said, oh, we can't dress like that. that. But what happened? Slowly but sure, we have authentic narrations of the first generation that they discouraged dressing like the Persians. And within a few generations, the Muslims dressing like the Persians. Okay? We have authentic generation, uh, narrations. I told you yesterday, Imam Ahmad and others, Imam um, um, uh, Malik ibn Anas said that I didn't give fatwa in this masjid until 70 or 80 muhannakeen gave me the right to give fatwa, gave me ijazah. Muhannakeen. The muhannak, we talked about it. right? It was the norm. Everybody made tahnik. And that's why they said, to not make tahnik is tashabub al kuffar. Because there were civilizations that only did the turban and tucked it in. The Sudanese turban, how is it? Tahnik or dun tahnik? With, you don't know? Or, you don't know the Sudanese turban? Huh? Yeah, it is, uh, is there tahnik or no tahnik? No tahnik. Hmm? They go around and they tuck it in the back, they tuck it in the middle. Yeah, they don't go down. They don't go down. You're talking about the Mauritanian one. The Sudetwarik. The Sudanese one has no technique. Okay? So my point is that, and, and even by the th th three, four hundred years of the Hijra, we have athar from the scholars that say, well, the technique is no big deal now. So what happened from 100 Hijra to 300 Hijra? The same thing that's happening now with your pants and your whatnot. The same thing. This is a problem for us to think that it's only pants and shirts that are changing. No. It happened and it's going to happen. This is sunnah Allah fi khalqi. It's the way things are. Okay? Inshallah with that... Huh? Yeah, the skinny one is an issue because of awra. Okay? Last question because I have to go then. Yeah. Yeah, but see, do, they expect Allah's reward for this. And that becomes a bid'ah. No, I mean, the, the issue comes, do you want to support them in this, in this thing that they're doing? And it's a case-by-case -case basis. If you feel that, and you know, I mean, in our lands, in India, Pakistan, everybody knows that some groups don't do the gyarmi, and some groups do it. You can... Even more reason for you to give him da'wah, to be polite and say, you know, I don't do these types of things, you know. Invite me another day or I'll invite you another day. But listen, I mean, in the end of the day, it's a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not saying it's haram to go. I'm not saying it's haram. It really depends on what his niyyah is, what he's doing, you know. There are levels of gyarmi. <laughs> not every gyarmi is exactly the same. There are levels. So you use your judgment call. If it is extreme and it is something that is beyond, I would say, and, and the, where they are invoking other than Allah If they're calling out to other than Allah I think that's definitely the red line We should not do that And if it's 
less than this, then you can make a judgment call in this